Over the last 18 months, we have seen one of the most dramatic and unexpected collapses of a player, who was once considered the greatest in all of Pro Valorant and the Esports Player of the Year. That being Ye, who since February 14th of last year, has not won a single match with a pro team. That's an 0-11 run, which is far removed from his peak on Optic, which led them to a Masters Trophy. So I decided to look back at Prime Ye and see how good he was to determine if the haters are right and he was just carried by FNS in the chamber meta, or if he truly was the real deal and the best at his peak, and if he can bounce back with Bleed as they try to turn the season around. But one way you can start your prime in making viral gaming content is with Frame Drop. Whether it's podcasts, interviews, or my favorite, gaming content, Frame Drop easily takes the footage you have and turns it into viral clips that you can upload on YouTube, Twitch, or even TikTok. And with the new AI enhancements, Frame Drop has just gotten better with clear AI generated subtitles in over 25 languages, as well as detecting your best highlights to share with the world with minimum work on your part. So check them out in the description. Thanks, FrameDrop.ai. Before we get to the true peak Ye had with the NV slash Optic Core, I needed to dispel one rumor about Ye. He was not just dominant with Optic and the Chamber meta. From the start of Valorant, he had been a standout player. He actually started his pro career with Andbox, joining them for the first strike event in 2020. But he really started catching people's attention on Jet with some crystal clear aim and insane reaction times, putting up numbers such as a 317 ACS during stage three with an insane 35% headshot rate and one of the best KDs in all of stage two. And while the team around him was never really up to par, he still got them to qualify for the first two NA Challengers events but stumbled against more refined teams. But even then, Ye looked like the best player out there day in and out, with him fragging out against players such as Penny, Leaf, and even Tens once. Which, funny enough, the only player that really diffed him during this time was Wardell. And I know people don't really like him now, but if you think I should make a video looking at how good he was at the time, let me know down in the description, which you can also subscribe there. But really, it was clear that Ye deserved to be on a team that could use this insane head-clicking ability to make a truly deep run for North America and threaten Sentinel's stranglehold on the region. And that's when the core of Optic came into the picture. And while at the time named Envy, IGL FNS could not ignore the incredible duelist lighting up the scoreboard, swapping out their part-time duelist Mummy to bring in Ye to complete the team ahead of stage three challengers, with three spots up to make it to the second ever international land, Masters Berlin. So before Ye joined the team, Envy had always been pushing to break into the upper tier of North American Valorant, with a super experienced IGL and FNS steering the ship with a cracked young duo of Crashies and Victor who could flex on different roles no problem, and an ice cold clutch player in Marved. But they always needed that last piece to finally be able to break the glass ceiling and start to surpass the kings of NA Valorant and to make some noise internationally. But once Ye joined the roster, it fit like a glove as they hit the ground running with minimal practice into the hardest matches Ye had faced up to this point in his career. In his match debut, he picked up 60 kills, with 18 of them being first kills to be the difference maker to make it past TSM, with him specifically frying on the op. And with that debut win, they were already thrusted into another showdown with the original Masters winning Sentinels team. And in the first map of Icebox, he struggled to get going as the two-headed dragon of Shazam and Tens was too much for him in his first round matchup against truly great talent. But even then, the team as a whole kept it close, losing by only 13 to 11. But with the poor performance, he could have easily rolled over and become a non-factor for his team on Haven. But this is when we start seeing glimpses of who he is and would become as he picked up a map high six first kills to push his team within inches of forcing a map three. But ultimately, Sick was able to get them across the finish line to defeat Envy in another close map. But either way now, they fall down to the elimination bracket where one slip could end their hopes for Berlin. They needed to win their next two matches to snag the third place spot and sneak into their first international event, all within under a month of adding Ye as their main entry and duelist. But like every player on the team, Ye was able to show he had some ability to flex into other agents, such as Sage from time to time, with him helping them win a close bind against FaZe to force the map three where he exploded with the jet op with Crashies dominating on Sova. And it became more and more clear how they could play off each other as Ye looked able to get a kill almost every round, with him rarely dying without a clicking ahead of the other team. While there's a solid chance that either Victor, Crashies, or Marv will just have a great map to make it too hard for most teams to deal with, leading to Ye picking up 12 first kills to march their way past Xset to qualify for Berlin. 
seeming like they're growing their cohesion stronger and stronger every map they play together. With them now just having to pass the two early titans of North American Valorant with 100 thieves and sentinels. And while they were unable to defeat 100 thieves in a map 5 that saw their map pull be strained, they began to prep for the international competition, where the best of the best will be trying to take down the North American teams after they reigned supreme in the first masters. Envy and Ye needed to be ready for this, especially with most top team success being dictated in these early tournaments by the skill and consistency of their main duelist. But on September 11th, 2021, the prime of Ye's pro Valorant career started as they swept both their group stage opponents in Keedstar and Crew, with every player on Envy showing how disciplined and ahead of the game they were under FNS skillful play calling and prep they had ahead of the tournament. But what really turned heads is the newest superstar duelist quickly minted El Diablo after he put up almost 30 kills in his international map debut and he didn't slow down, putting up insane ACSs in each map as he could not be stopped. And with him clicking, no one could stop them going into playoffs. But now they were facing two major obstacles to shock the world and make it to the grand finals of their first masters. They would have to beat the two most clouded and dominant teams from their own region, something Ye had only done once with Anbox, where he had to play out of his mind just to scrape by. Now, this was with much higher stakes. But this is Prime Ye, and he could not be stopped, as he had a match of a lifetime against Sentinels on Jet, picking up 11 op kills and 13 first kills, with 6 of them on Tens, acting kind of like a torch passing moment from Tens' first Prime to Ye's only Prime so far that went on for over a year. They shocked the Valorant world by eliminating Sentinels after winning an overtime map thanks to a 4k by Crashies and Ye shutting down Sentinels completely on both halves of Split to move to a meeting with 100 Thieves who had just pulled off a miraculous 12 and 7 comeback against Ascent. A true match to crown the new number one team in the Americas, with Sentinels now slain. And it looked like it would be 100 Thieves' fairy tale run. But here, Ye and Envy were the main characters, as Ye pulled off 31 kills on Haven, then finished it with 20 kills on Ascent to eliminate 100 Thieves in 2 0 fashion to keep them perfect so far in the tournament going into the grand finals against Gambit. And while they got so close to lifting the trophy to complete the dream run for Ye in his first real event with the team, repeating the dramatics that happened in Masters Reykjavik with Tens, they were ultimately swept by a really impressive Gambit team with Chronicle picking up 73 kills in the matchup to give Europe their first Masters win, leaving Ye and Envy with a sour taste in their mouth. But either way, he put up record-breaking numbers with a VLR rating of 1.3 and an ACS of 280.2, the second best in Valorant history behind Tenza's legendary Masters Reykjavik run, as well as 55 first kills to only 29 first deaths, something no one even got close to, with this being his best statistical performance, even though they fell short in the grand finals. But this definitely wasn't his career's peak. That was in 2022, because even after this legendary performance and becoming the favorites to win champions, they weren't able to live up to the hype they built as they lost to the eventual winners Ascend with one of the only players who could diff Ye in CNED looking remarkable, then being eliminated in brutal fashion to X10, winning in overtime to end Ye's season with Envy. While his 2021 season's stats are incredible with Envy, this was only the start of his peak as they changed names to Optic Gaming. And here, Ye would become the true best player in the world, and it started with one French agent. Right from the release of the new agent, it was clear that Ye should start putting him into his agent pool. It was just clear how powerful he would be with the overpowered tour de force, giving him a free op that he could dominate on every few rounds, especially with the nerfs coming into his primary agent jet. And it fit him perfectly as while the game plan for optics still needed to be ironed out early in the season, Ye was dropping massive performance after massive performance as his usage rate of chamber started to rise more and more as it continued to get his team out of close rounds and matches throughout the first challengers event leading them all the way to the grand finals against the Guard, which they barely lost in map 5, qualifying for Masters Reykjavik, but without the bye to playoffs. So without that bye, they'll have to fight through another group stages to hopefully redeem themselves after the absolute fail they had last major event. And they were set to play the team that upset them only a handful of months before, now as Exertia. And Ye and Optic still couldn't get the job done, with them being swept in two maps 13 to 10 both times. With Ye playing well, but he couldn't outplay a player that would eventually play with him on bleed, scary, to force them to the brink of elimination right away. 
And at this point, the narrative around Optic and Ye were that while they were a very talented team with a highlight reel player in Ye, they had their chance in Berlin and couldn't rebound after they had fallen, losing so many maps they should win, keeping them out of the top tier of pro Valorant. And that would be how we might still see this team and him if he fell out of Reykjavik in last place. But this is when Ye and Optic went on their dream run. First defeating Crew 2-0 with Ye showing why Chamber is so overpowered at the time, then defeating their demons in Exertia in the poetic deciding match in a 26-15 round differential, finally overcoming them to join the guard in the playoffs with another chance to redeem themselves and prove they are better than this young rookie team that had taken the region by storm they took map 1, 13-7, with 23 kills on Chamber for Ye, and a big 1v1 clutch for Marv to start giving him the nickname Iceman. And while the Guard were able to put up a fight in map 2 to take it to a deciding map, Optic were able to put the Guard away in the final rounds thanks to a clutch performance from FNS, who was able to pick up the slack when Ye doesn't have the best maps, pushing them to a semi-finals matchup against the South Korean juggernauts, DRX where they couldn't afford to have Ye be off for any map. As against a team of this caliber and discipline, Optic needs the team to be firing in all cylinders to have a chance to make it to the upper finals, so close to another grand finals appearance after Berlin. But after losing map 1, things looked bad for Optic. But that's when Ye proved why he's the best player at the time, cementing his legendary status with him and Crashies, leading them to a close win on Icebox, then a 27 kill map to shatter the hearts of the Korean team in overtime to win Split. And while they barely lost in the upper finals against Loud to start the rivalry we know as Valorant's version of El Clasico, they were able to rebound to take out the dark horse, Zeta, with every member of Optic stepping up to prove that they not only have the top two player in the world in Ye and veteran leadership, but also a well-rounded team with everyone able to pop off and win important rounds even when Ye doesn't get the opening duel on Chamber, leading to a grand finals where they could redeem themselves and defeat Loud to lift a Masters trophy and validate all the work expectations they had on themselves. And right from the beginning, it was clear that this match was going to come down to who will win the superstar match, Aspas or Ye. And while Aspas would have his peak later in the season, this was Ye's moment as he dominated not just on Chamber, but also Jet as he picked up a match high plus 23 kills to deaths, with the rest of his team pulling off 6 clutches and 9 4Ks to steal 2 overtimes in a row to defeat Loud and lift the Masters Reykjavik trophy, keeping it in NA with Ye being considered the undisputed top player now, and it looked like he would continue his dominance with Optic throughout the rest of the season to win another trophy. But it didn't happen as Ye and Optic continued to be one of the best teams in the world, but in Copenhagen they ran into Paper Rex, who had just truly debuted their insane playstyle in international play, throwing off Optic in the upper finals and ultimately being eliminated in third place by FPX, who had probably the only player that could keep up with Ye in a chamber duel in Ardis, helping his team of veterans past Optic to eventually win the Masters. And in Champions, they played amazing as well, as El Clasico was in full swing, as Loud and Optic played each other three times, with them splitting the first two matchups, leading to an intense Grand Finals. And with so much hanging in the balance for both teams, neither of them slowed down, with all 10 players looking like the best in the world. But the matchup again came down to if Ye could put the team on his back in rounds and create impossible highlights, which in the end didn't work with them, falling in map 4 seeing him only pick up 11 kills to lose in the final hurdle, crowning Loud as the world champions. Looking back at the stats Ye had during his peak in 2022, it's clear that he was the best in the world at the time, with him being so deadly consistent in international matches, being one of the main reasons why Optic went first, third, and second in the three major events. While he never had a performance as statistically dominant as Berlin, he undoubtedly put one of the most successful seasons a Valorant player has had so far. But during the offseason, it was announced that Optic didn't make franchising, breaking the hearts of not just fans of the org, but fans around the league, as Optic felt like a staple in esports, especially having such a dramatic finish to the most iconic rivalry against Loud. There would be no more El Clasico, and no more chance for Optic to continue their dominance, meaning that the team had to make a decision, try to stay together on another franchise team, and continue their current roster under a new banner, or find lucrative deals on their own as they're all super valuable in free agency after putting incredible numbers up last year and all could be leaders on their own teams. And while FNS, Crashies, and Victor joined NRG together, Marv and Ye went their own way, with Ye announcing he joined Cloud9 on October 17th, making waves across the league. But unfortunately for Ye, this is where the chaos we see now would begin, 
as after just one offseason tournament and two matches in lock-in, where no one really looked bad, Ye was dropped without warning. There had been some speculation and info thrown around, but it seems like Cloud9 decided they were paying Ye too much and released him where he would sit out of Pro Valorant for two whole months, stifling any momentum he had from his peak last year. He would then go on a winless streak on the creator-owned Disguise team, where they massively underperformed after a hyped roster announcement, ending his entire 2023 season with only one win, and the team he was playing on being relegated from Tier 2, a high fall from just a year ago winning a Masters and almost winning the World Championship. And it seemed like he was cursed as after announcing he was making his return to franchise Valorant with the Pacific team Bleed, they have not won a game yet, being eliminated in two matches in the kickoff, as well as losing against Talon in their split one opener, a team that finished almost last last season, and now going through enough drama to completely throw this team off for the rest of the year. But have these two last seasons been his play's fault, or has he just been unlucky with the teams underperforming around him in this tier one matches? Well, let's take a look at his stats from the first three matches of the season. And while the kickoff turn was definitely more of a growing moment for him and his team as he tried to figure roles out, he was able to pick up 27 kills in a map against T1. But his stats did suffer as a result of playing four different agents, as he never really looked comfortable. But in their recent opening match of Split 1 against Talon, Ye looked a lot more sure of himself, looking a lot closer to his former gameplay as he filled the entry role as Raisin Jet, with him picking up a match-high 15 first kills, leading to a much more normal normal ACS for him, but ultimately the team around him is in complete disarray as new players like Zest try to integrate quickly with the multi-language slash region team, losing the opener against Talon in three maps. While I believe Bleed as a whole will not be able to rebound, I do think Ye will continue to put up some pretty high numbers on entry as he continues to get more and more confident in himself again. But the team and strategies are not helping him much, which will most likely lead to them being one of the bottom teams in the Pacific throughout the season. And while he will not reach his prime again this year, 2024 should be a great launching point for him to join a more organized team next year like 100 Thieves or even Cloud9 again, and make a dramatic return to North America to try and become a top player in the world yet again. So check that out in my description, where you can also find a link to try Framedrop for yourself and make viral content with ease. Thanks Framedrop for sponsoring this video.